Hey gang, I've been uh, ruminating over some things, pontificating. Oh, I thought it'd be a neat idea to turn this all into a video. It's maybe not. Um, if you don't like it, don't land blast me too much. Uh, I'm going to gloss over things. I'm not going to get into math. I'm going to kind of maybe try and connect the dots uh, to work our way through a couple of different things. Uh, give you some ideas. Uh, my training was as an electrical engineer originally and uh, I've done some stuff in VLSI and uh, space electronics and there's things and also in imagers and there's things that I when I was first going through school I never would have never occurred to me and there's all these eye openers that were going along and I thought well that's neat, well that's neat. And the other night I was just sitting here contemplating these things and I thought, eh, maybe it's worth it to share some of this with somebody because, I, you know, maybe, maybe you care. So, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different things. It's going to bounce back and forth, and it's going to waste however much time if you watch this whole thing a, a day of your life, maybe. I don't know. So, let's start with some things that maybe, well, maybe if you're a freshman or, or still in grade school, I don't know, college. If you're in an engineering track for electrical engineering, you probably already know this. So let's, let's start with a um, piece of silicon. And let's connect a wire on it. And Let's dope it. So we'll take this piece of silicon, we'll coat it with uh, something to keep what we're doing from getting into it. And on this side, we'll, we'll put it in a really, really hot oven with uh, uh, a material that will diffuse into the silicon and create an excess of holes, or if you prefer, a lack of electrons. So now I'm going to have a bunch of holes over here. So this side's going to be positively biased, if you will, in relationship to this side. And well, while we're at it, let's go and do the exact same thing on the other side, only with something that'll make it have more electrons. So I've got a bunch of electrons over here, and I've got a bunch of holes. Whoops holes over here, those are not hydrogens, electrons, 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 electrons. And what I have created now is what we normally call a diode. Now this has some neat, neat uh, properties. Uh, so the first thing is we'll talk about something called a diffusion length. And the diffusion length is how far these guys will travel generally before they recombine with something. And so what I end up with is a few of these holes go, well, let's do it the other way because that's the way that makes more sense to me. A couple of these electrons jump across this boundary, if you will, and fall into a hole. And they kind of become happy because an electron wants a hole to be in, and a hole wants to have an electron in it. And so about one diffusion length either way, I kind of get this area that has, that's happy. So now there's really no holes or electrons there. Everybody's gathered together and having a party and singing Kumbaya. And, but over here there's an excess of holes. I mean, there's a few electrons running around. And over here is an excess of electrons. There's a couple of holes running around, but mostly electrons and mostly holes. So what happens here? Um, well, we learn right off the bat, right, in our, in our first electronics classes that, oh, well, if I put 
positive voltage here and a negative voltage here, current will flow. But if I put a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here, um, no current flows. Right? So what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is if I put a positive voltage here, well, holes are have a positive charge because they're missing an electron, right? So that pushes these holes this way. They want to get away from that. And, well, they put a negative charge here, and he's like, so like charges repel and, and unlike charges attract, right? So that pushes these electrons over this way. And what you actually get is, draw this here, that's my silicon and my P and my N. I started with my diffusion, my gap being here, and now it's here. So I've modulated this diffusion area. I've made it smaller. So if I put a big enough positive over here and a big enough negative over here, eventually these things either come together or they actually cross over. And now my holes can go over to the negative side and zip right out. And my electrons can go over to the positive side and zip right out. And out here, all of a sudden, my battery's happy because it has current flowing through it. Yay! And of course, my utility company's happy because I'm using energy. Yay! So well, that's interesting. So what happens the other way? Well, it's kind of the reverse, right? I I put a positive over here, well, all these electrons want to come out here, and so they move and move and move, and, and my, my uh, diffusion area gets wider and wider and wider, and so I don't conduct. So that's the first part of this story. We'll talk about that for we're done talking about that. But what happens is if you look, if I were to make a graph of voltage, negative voltage, zero volts, and current, positive current, I'm gonna call it negative current, it's really just the direction it's flowing through, right? Um, so what we see is generally in a silicon diode, this point where we talked about where when you have a positive voltage on here, we generally look at it as this, right? And that knee is at about 0 0.7 volts. Uh, for silicon, for germanium, it's about 0 0.3 volts, and other materials might have different. Um, so, but what happens also is, as I go negative to positive, so, so I put the positive here and the negative there, I start coming out here and eventually I turn on and I get a lot of current. And really, this should be like that, right? And this is what we call avalanche. So this is how we make a Zener diode. It's actually a regular diode hooked up backwards. And I'll tell you this little trick. Um, if you use a regular diode and turn it backward, well, you can do it with the base of a transistor at about 8 volts or so. They'll start to conduct. And, and they'll become a voltage regulator because as the voltage goes more, you just get more current. And, and it doesn't take very far. And then you blow things up. But So what's happening? And we described what's happening here earlier when the two diffusion areas cross over each other. Um, what happens here at Avalanche? What happens here at Avalanche is inside this potential area here, this diffusion, there's an, there's an electric field, right? And as I push this further and further back, uh, these, these guys are basically getting squished in there. and, and there's getting to be a lot of energy here in between this field to keep them apart. And finally you get to a point where these guys have so much energy that they can just 
jump across anyway. And usually what happens, it's an avalanche. As he jumps across, he smacks into something and he might drop two more through and he comes through and he hits two holes, come back, and it's a cascading effect, right? This guy comes in, he hits two. He hits one, two electrons come off. These guys have two electrons come off. And you go into heavy conduction and bang. We're off to the races, current shoots through the roof. Um, and if you didn't mean for it to happen, probably you get a, a uh, something like this coming out of your computer and, and your PC explodes and man, that's bad. All right. <coughs> So let's zoom in a little closer from there. Um, that was the way I learned it in, in tech school many, many years ago. I'm not going to worry about the avalanche. Avalanche really comes down like this. There's some leakage current and it goes like that. And over here on this side, we see this. And this is actually an exponential curve. It's an e to the, loosely, it's i, uh, I'm going from memory and it's been a long time. It's like i equals some k e to the v t, if I remember right. Maybe it's e to the negative dt, I don't remember. But t is thermal temperature in Kelvin's absolute temperature. E is 2.78, if I remember right. K can depend on the device and the material and whatever. And then there's like a, somewhere that breakover voltage comes in there somewhere. So like maybe it's 0 0.7 up here or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, because this is nonlinear, there's fun things you can do with it, but we won't get into. But there are some things, some, some diodes, um, you actually have a curve, and I'm having a brain fart right now, I can't remember, they have a curve that looks like this. And so then you can play in these regions and you can actually turn the diode into an amplifier. Uh, but we're not going to go there right now because that's not the, the line of thought that I was thinking about. The line of thought I was thinking about was the fact that this is an exponential curve here. So wouldn't it be nice we could do something that did something similar. Oh, and let's talk about this for a minute. There's another thing with this uh, diode. A capacitor is two parallel plates, right? And the capacitance is, is proportional to the area of the plates divided by the distance between them, loosely, with some k factor in there. So, if I look at this plate, it's some metal or something. That's a bad drawing. And there's some distance apart, D. And the area is length times width. Then we can figure out the capacitance. Well, there's the same kind of thing going on inside of our diodes that you have to be careful of is as you push these this diffusion region, it acts as two plates. And as you push it closer and closer together, the capacitance goes up and up and up and up. And as you pull them apart, the capacitance goes down and down and down. And there's some diodes that are specifically made for this. You see their symbol usually looks something like that. It's called a varactor. It's a variable capacitor. Um, but this happens even with just a regular diode. And when you get into really serious uh, analog computations and stuff, you have to take that into account because it can do funny things to your system. So let's go back now where I was going before. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to have something that comes on and comes off and gives you some gain? We'll call this thing transistor. In this particular case, I like NPNs because they're easier for me to deal with in my head. And what we have is sort of, depending on how you see it drawn, 
an N, an N, and a P area. If you look at this, you say, well, that's really kind of two diodes strapped back to back like that with takeoff there, which is not quite the truth. Whenever you make them in silicon, what you'll see is you'll see the emitter, the base, and the collector. Oh, so emitter, base, collector. Emitter, eh, emitter, base, collector. I take it back, I did it the wrong way. Collector, base, emitter. Something like this. With your ties, like that. And what's going on here is you're creating fields again, just like we did before. So um, a standard silicon NPN, Back to my tech days, uh, there's a voltage drop here when it's turned on of 0.7 volts into your circuit. And you've got some I base here, you've got I emitter here, and you've got I collector there. And if we remember our stuff, and there's some beta and um, I C equals beta I B and I E equals I B plus I C, if I recall. Yeah, you've got this current plus that current and this current is that this times beta. So we can do our things and, and it has this nice exponential curve and you can do math with an exponential curve because now you can do logarithms and I can take two currents and I can add them together and our voltages so right if I take a voltage in and I get an exponent out uh, that's an e function an exponent function e to the x or e to the b if you will and if I take a current into this if I look at it the other way that becomes a log function. So I can take a log x, log of v, that's log base e, or it's, a, it's a natural log, ln of v. So we can do math with these too if you want to get really clever. I've seen that happen. That's how analog multipliers work. Um, if you've ever seen one of those, they're kind of rare these days. So this is neat. But the problem with this, of course, is that to get any current to flow through it, I have to have current going into it, so it's kind of wasteful on my current. I have to drive it. So wouldn't it be nice if there was something that, say, um, oh, and if I take the, uh, with the BJT, and I say current, no, what is it? It's uh, B, B, vice, uh, V, collector, emitter, and then the curve is current, right? If I remember right. So now we have this array of things where we can plan our circuit that we can get amplification out for a very small VB in. I can get a very large VCE out. Um, and that's how my amplifier works. And I'll set up some, some quiescent point here, or Q point, and we'll operate around that. But again, there's those parasitic capacitors and things like that in there that are keeping it from running as fast as we want. So, uh, but uh, again, back to power, wouldn't it be nice if there was some way to um, keep that current from flowing in? And that's where a MOSFET's nice. Um, so again, I'll use an N MOSFET because this is what I'm most comfortable working with, but PMOS is similar. Um, and if you look at these, they have a very similar curve um, set that looks like this, with this switch over being around VT. 
Uh, I'm not going to give you the formula for those because I don't remember. And they don't have any uh, current flow, or very little current flow through here. And so I'm getting into moss and sea moss now. One of the interesting things, though, you look at this, and, you, and if you look at the this function for uh, a MOS transistor, it's a square root uh, rather than a, a e to the x power. So you can actually, doing the right things, you can maybe calculate a square root with this. But um, gee, wouldn't it be nice in this technology if there was an exponential? And there is. It's just that it's way down here. If we zoom in on this area right here and go way down and say VT is here, actually I guess VT would be here, what we see is this has an exponential function here and then it goes into its linear mode and then it goes into its saturation mode. So let's talk about these things for a second. Very similar to a BJT, BJT's exponential up to linear, up to saturation. Saturation means you're not going to get any more current out of it. No matter how much I make VT, I'm not going to get any more current. Um, for a given VC, uh, VCE. So, in MOSFETs, we talk about this as being the linear region, the saturation region, and the linear region is where you want to use it if you're using it as an amplifier. And down here is called subthreshold. where you can actually use them as though they were a BJT. But this is painful because the currents when you're talking down here are like picoamps. And picoamps ain't much, so it's, it's hard to work with. So let's go back to our MOS transistor then for a minute and not worry about that. So mostly what you hear about MOS, you hear about CMOS, complementary MOS. Um, is for logic. So we started out with just NMOS. Or maybe it was PMOS. I don't remember. Um, you tie it up to a resistor. You tie your output here. DDD ground. And if I put a high signal in here, this conducts, right? This guy turns on. And what we're going to assume is that we're running uh, our voltage curves, uh, you know, so ground is down here and our VT is here. So we're always in saturation in a digital process. We're using this thing as a switch. It's on or it's off. We're, we're either way down here where there's um, nanoamps of current or we're way up here where we're giving all the current we can give. And so we're really overdriving these things hard when we do this. So if I turn this on, I get current going through here, and this comes from VDD and drops to ground, and if once it comes down, this comes up. So I've basically made an inverter. And, but the problem with this inverter is anytime I'm here in this mode, I've got current flowing through, and so it's constantly using current, and that's kind of no good, right? So somebody came along and said, well, why don't we put PMOS in here, too? And this is CMOS is a complementary MOS. It means for every NMOS transistor, there is a PMOS transistor. I'm going to draw it this way. Actually, I'm not even going to put the arrows on it. It's just easier. And to make an inverter, then we would do this. Tie our output here. This is still VDD. Tie our input here. Ground. So what happens um, when this is low, zero volts, this guy's on and this guy's off. So that means I have current flowing here, which means... I have a high, I have a 1. And if this is 5 volts, which is a 1, well, then this guy turns off, 
this guy turns on, and now current can flow this way, and I have a zero out. We all know this. This is simple digital electronics, right? This is this is the very first circuit you learn. Um, of course, there's some switchover times here. This doesn't instantly turn on, and this doesn't instantly turn off. Um, so there's some time here in the middle of the switching where you do get some current that flows all the way through and spaces things up. And this is one of the reasons why, as if you look at a digital device's power curve, they'll usually have something that looks like this, power versus megahertz. And it basically starts off here and goes up like that. And so this power here, this baseline power, is what you lose going through these things. I mean, actually, it comes up like that. Because if you're not switching at all, you lose basically none, just the leakage of the transistor. So there's some leakage level. And then there's this switching power that goes through that you're never going to get below uh, as long as you're switching. And then you're going to get, um, in these, this is a capacitive load when you're driving the next stage. So if I say an inverter into an inverter, right? This is just one of these into another one of these. Um, what I'm basically seeing is a capacitive load. And so when I turn this on, this energy comes over here, gets stored in this capacitor. Then when I switch it the other way, this energy comes back out and goes to ground. That's how I get my zero out. I discharge that capacitor. So the really small capacitors, there's a lot of energy going back and forth. And over a chip, it uses up power. And again, our power company's happening. The computer manufacturers are happy because now they get to sell us liquid cooling and because we're switching faster and faster and faster. And there have been tricks that have been done to love the power and make life a little better, but you know, it's the basics. So let's say I've got a chip full of inverters or a wafer. I'm going to go to a semiconductor foundry and I'm going to make a wafer. And on this wafer, there's going to be all these inverters on it. That thing I just drew, two transistors. So let's take a cut right through the middle of this wafer. And let's see what an inverter looks like in there so we can better understand our CMOS process. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to draw it like this. So where we've cut this wafer, we're looking straight on the end of it. Now, when they make these wafers, what they do is they have this great big tank full of uh, liquid silicon. It's all heated up. It's nice and hot. And they put in one seed, which is a single crystal piece of silicon, on the end of a stick. And they drop it down into there and they spin it really, really slowly. And as it spins, uh, it allows silicon molecules to come around and grab on. And, and they form along these same crystal structures, the same crystal lines. And they slowly spin this and they slowly pull it out. And they finally end up with a silicon ingot that really looks like a big silicon turd. And um, it is one crystal, generally speaking. There will be defects in it, but everything assembles itself on crystal planes, and it is a pretty perfect crystal, the way they've got things, processes done these days. So then they will figure out where the crystal boundaries are, and they will cut this thing along crystal boundaries, along structural lines, crystal lines, on the lattice. And they make a wafer, and then usually, you can get your wafers done different ways, but usually what you'll see is they'll go and they'll drop them in an oven in a, in a chemical vapor uh, deposition or uh, implantation process, and they will dope the wafer so that it is very slightly peat. 
So we'll call it P plus. And of course, it's going to grow a layer of silicon dioxide on the top, so we'll call this silicon. But what we do in our processing is we grind these off, we make photo masks just like they make uh, printed circuit boards and whatnot, right? You expose it to light, you, you smear some stuff on, you expose it to light, and then it becomes resistive to etching, to chemical etching. So we put a pattern on them, you know, and the pattern, uh, if, you've ever, if you've ever done any VLSI, uh, uh, you'll have something that looks like this. Some of you will recognize this right off the bat. A lot of different color here. I'll make this red because that's the color I'm used to seeing them in, in, in CAD software. So what have I just drawn here? I've just drawn our inverter. So I'm going to describe this and the process that's used to make it up here. So this is, we would make masks that have each one of these things. So the first thing we would do is we would do this big square one right here. And there'd be, you know, many of these on here. So we would make a mask. We would lay this stuff down. And then we would image this picture on there with a really bright light. And these days it's extreme ultraviolet light because the pitch is so small. And this is like film, right? It, 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 there's a reaction due to the light. Then you take it out and you dip it in a developing tank and you develop it just like you used to do film in the old days. Sometimes some people still do it. And then you put it in an etching process, and the etching process is going to pull off here, where you want your deposition to happen, and make that a little wider. And then you put it in an oven. In the oven, there could be an ion implantation where they have this uh, ion source over here, and it's a big, like the inside of a TV tube. Oh wow, I'm getting old. Uh, high differential voltage, a hot source here that boils off atoms, and they zip that way to where, and it's just like a machine gun, bing, bang, 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 and all the, all the atoms come over here, and they bang into this, and what you get is an implantation. And so these would be N wells. So this would be like an N plus. And so one of the questions I had was, well, what happened to all the ions that were in here before that made this P plus? Well, they're still there. I put enough of this new ion in there to overcome that and overcome it so far that it becomes an N plus. And so we do these stages again, right? So I'll, now I'm done with this, and I'll go clean off my board, clean off my silicon, and I'll do another etchant layer, another photoresist layer. Uh, and, but what they actually do is they let silicon dioxide grow for a self-aligning gate process. They let the silicon grow, silicon dioxide on it. So you put it in a hot oven and blow, up, blow pure oxygen across it, and it grows. And then they will lay down this stuff, which is your poly, uh, poly, polysilicon. 
and it lays down here. Maybe I should draw it in red so we keep our stuff the same. Then we come back and do a mask again, and we do another implantation turn. So when we do this mask, it cuts off these areas here, like this. We etch out into our silicon. That's too close. And now we hit it with a heavy um, in here. So we'll do this side first. We get an in well here. So this is in plus plus. So it's really in on this side. And on this side, we do a P. So this becomes P plus plus. P plus plus. And one of these is a tub tie. So that makes sure that this is at the right potential. And again, if we look at our, uh, our FETs, that uh, threshold voltage, VT, part of it is based on what the bulk is. Uh, a more appropriate um, drawing is of this. So we've got the gate, the source, the drain, and the bulk. And a lot of times you'll see them look like this, or actually for a P it would be this, and for a N it would be this. We'd see that they're tied together, and that's fine. Um, for digital process, for analog processes, a lot of times you want to pull this out and you want to tweak it separately. All the tubs are usually tied together, though, so you've got to be careful. If you do it to one, you're going to do it to all, unless you do special process rules and fabrication steps to make sure that's not the case. So now that we've created these implantations, now we put in our vias, which are usually tungsten. If, well, they used to be. They're not anymore, I don't guess. It's metal. And this metal goes off. You connect it to BDD. BDD. This one goes off to ground ground. This becomes my output. Output. And somewhere back, these are tied together back here, we can't really see them. That's my input. So, now we have gone from this drawing to this drawing to this drawing. We're working our way down into silicon. This is looking at it. This is our conceptual schematic. This is what it looks like if you were to do this in cadence or magic or something like this. You'd probably draw something real similar to this. And then this is if you cut this silicon right through the middle and look at it end on. So let's take a look at this. How does this work? So we talked about diodes before, right? Well, this is an NP, this is a PN junction, right? So this is a diode. And this is a diode. And this is a diode, and that's a diode. And actually even this is a diode. And this is usually tied to some reference, usually ground. So just like before, we get these diffusion lengths, one diffusion length in, this all diffuses out and nothing happens, right? 
So we're going to just work with this NMOS right now. So before we talked about our curve and we talked about subthreshold and then linear and then saturation. So this is our linear region. This is our saturation region. And this is subthreshold region. What's going on here? And this is uh, VG, voltage on the gate. This is V DS, drain the source. So this is our source. This is our drain. And this is V or ID, uh, yeah, IDS, the current drain to source. So what happens here? If I don't put any voltage here. Just leave it hanging, and I put voltage on these two pins. Well, I tie this to ground, and I tie this to, I don't know, let's say 5 volts. Just for fun games. So what happens here? I have negatively biased this one, and this one basically has no bias, but it could have some. So we'll assume that they're both reverse biased diodes, right? So if I don't have an input FET voltage, and I turn it on, I try and put voltage across it. It's not going to conduct. It might conduct a little bit, but not very well. So now if I put a negative voltage on this, well, I am causing a field here through this gate oxide, Fox field oxide, to happen. And what it's doing is it's pulling holes up here. All these holes that might be running around in here want to come up here, and you're really horribly reverse biasing this. It's not going to conduct. So, as I start to put a positive voltage on this, we'll put a little bit on here. Well, that's going to pull a couple little electrons up here, and I'm going to start moving into my subthreshold region here. And as I put a little bit more, you know, I'm going to have just picoamps of current running through. And as I put a few, a little bit higher voltage, a little bit higher voltage, this is going to get more and more. I'm going to eventually get to here. And this is the point where I've put enough, I've managed to push enough electrons up into here that I actually kind of forward bias these two diodes. And um, current begins to flow. I actually haven't forward biased the diodes. I've pushed the P away. And now I've got a channel. It's called the channel for current to flow. So now we see that I get to some point, and the bigger I make, let's make this just barely plus, the bigger I make this, current doesn't flow anymore. So. I can make this bigger and bigger and bigger to a point, and what happens is, and understand these are on nanometer type scales, and we're at the atomic scale here. Um, if there was no differential in voltage between this, this field would come way down like this, right? I mean, we would fill this all full of electrons, and now as I add a slight positive voltage here, I start to get, uh, I'm going to draw this backwards, I know it. Um, this becomes positive, these electrons want to pull in. This starts to get a slight slant to it. Because as I'm pulling this positive, these electrons that are coming up through here, these leakage electrons, these electrons, they're sucking into there. And um, now I'm moving up my linear region, and I keep going here. Now I'm working my way up the curve. I'm pulling as much current through this as I can, but I'm causing the, the field forces, the electrostatic fields here, are causing this, this to modulate. And so you eventually get to this point here. It's called pinch off, if I remember right, which is basically the D in the curve right here, where now no more can go through. 
and now you're out here in your saturation region. And if you keep increasing this voltage, so I've gone up to here, I'm in saturation. Now if I keep increasing this voltage, what happens is I start to modulate the channel this way, where my channel's pushed way over here, but um, the electrons have enough energy coming in, there's enough of a field this way, to go ahead and pull them across this area in. It's, uh, I think, I'm not sure it's tunneling, but you know, they're moving pretty quick. And you can eventually get to the point where you get to punch through, uh, where this basically collapses and it doesn't matter what happens, and then you go into avalanche and bad things happen. And there's another little mushroom cloud. So, the first thing you should notice here is that an inverter has two transistors, and if you want to look at it that way, you could say that, in fact, one way to make an inverter is to use an active load and only drive one of them. So, something like that. And so this is an amplifier. An inverter is an amplifier. So if you want to get really clever in some of your designs, you can turn this into an amplifier. It's going to be a real twitchy amplifier because if we look at our V in, V out curve, right, it's... Uh, hmm, v in, V out where we see it kind of goes like this. It's almost a stair step. Um, if you go in and you zoom in on this real close, you'll see that it's really an angle like this. And so there is a region in there that is very small. So this is like zero to five volts. Or call it, if this was five volt CMOS, we'd call this say maybe one to four volts. And here, this would be like um, two to three volts. So for a one volt change in, I could get a three volt change out. Um, in fact, it's much smaller than that. It's it's like two. It's uh, two point five. So it's more like two point four to two point six. It's down to tens of volts, hundreds of volts. It's really hard to deal with. You have to be very careful when designing that kind of a circuit because it's inherently unstable. Um, it'll quickly saturate one way or the other and give you nothing. And when you run it right there at that little point where you can actually do something with it, the gain is tremendous. Okay, so we've talked about field strengths. Well, we've talked about this. Now there's another situation you can get into here. Uh, remember we drew two diodes back to back earlier? And we called it a transistor? And there's actually a, another transistor here. And this one is a, this one's an NPN. And this one's a PNP. And this material has some inherent resistance, right? And you can get a situation where, because your chip heats up, maybe, um, this resists, so there's always some leakage current running back and forth here because there's differences in potential between these different spots. And if I were to uh, let this leakage get low enough, I'm doing this wrong, so this isn't drawn quite right. the base of that guy. He goes into the base of this guy. He comes back out to there. There we go. Um, think like that. So he has a beta and he has a beta. And if I look at the data sheet for a 2N3904BJT NPN or a 2N3906, Uh, they both have betas of 
around 100, if I remember right, 99, 95, something like that. So let's think about this. If I manage to get one nanoamp of current to flow into here, millimicro nano pico. So one nano, now I've got, so I start out with one nano amp, but it goes through here and gets multiplied, so now I've got 100 nano amps. Really 101, right, because we have this extra, but. Um, but then he comes into here, and he flows through this guy's base, and now we multiply that times 100, and now we've got millimicro, 10 micro amps, and that flows back into here, and now I've got one milliamp, and that flows back into here, and I've got 100 milliamps, and that flows back into here, and I've got 10 amps, and I've got a bad thing going on, don't I? I've got this current flowing. This is called a silicon controlled rectifier, a CR. And these are something that you use. They have a symbol that looks like this. So this is your gate input and VDD and, and ground or something like that. And what happens here is they're injecting some current into this thing to get it started and it'll run away and it will latch and it becomes a switch. It closes and it stays closed until you remove this voltage at which point it opens back up. And then when you apply the voltage again it stays off until you hit the ground, or the gate, put, put voltage in, and it switches back on. Fine and dandy when you want it to happen, not at all fine and dandy when you don't want it to happen. This is a bad thing on, on most ICs, right? especially digital, you don't want this thing to run away. As soon as there's 10 amps going through this, your, your, your AMD processor explodes, and your Pentium sits there and points at it and giggles and says, ah, 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 ah look what happened to you, you should have bought Intel. Well. Or maybe it's the other way around. Yeah. Don't be a hater. I'm just joking. So, fortunately, these have fairly high resistances. Well, what, would, what could cause something like this? Well, cosmic rays, gamma rays, x-rays, any kind of radiation, uh, when it zips in from outer space and goes through your chip, it leaves a trail of electron hole pairs behind it. The energy is enough that they're absorbed and the electrons are blown right out of their valence shells and they, you create a momentary electron and hole, and they usually right away recombine. But if it happens to be right through this diffusion area, you can have your hole go that way and your electron go that way and recombine out here, and you've created a current. Most of the, and there's natural radiation around us all the time, right? We've got um, radioactive decay of just ceramic materials, in fact. Um, in fact, uh, the chips on old PCs used to be made out of ceramics, and this was uh, some amount of a problem. It's one of the reasons why they had a parity chip in there in the old days, was to detect that you'd had a bit flip somewhere, because this is enough to flip a bit. Because of the way memory's made, which I won't get into right this instant, but I might come back to. Um, so, but this is interesting, right? I've got a way to modulate fields here and change the conductivity of something. And I've got a way to make things explode if I wanted to. But let's back off. Let's not make them explode. One of the problems is when these cosmic rays and things happen is you get some of these electron hole things happen. The EHPs happen right here at boundary layers. And what happens is your field oxide can generate a charge in it can develop a charge. So I think I've talked about all of this that I want to talk about right now. I think we've got the, the general gist. What happens when your field oxide starts to charge up, I don't know, it could be E's or it could be holes. It all depends on what kind of thing it's being bombarded by and what's happening to it. But this charge comes up, and if you remember your uh, there's VT square root of something I through a FET VDD VGS I don't even remember VGS some relationship similar to that um, what this does is it modulates VT 
So VT goes one way or the other, and then your transistors don't act the way you expect them to. In a digital circuit, they start to leak more, or you can't turn them on. Either of which is a bad thing. You're either using more current or you can't make your stuff work. Eventually, the charge gets built up enough that nothing works. Um, when we talk about uh, space electronics and radiation, this is called your total ionizing dose. Uh, it's the amount of ionization it gets in here, and it can cause this to not work after some amount of time. Um, it turns out that newer processes with the, like, if you go back to the, when I first learned, when it was like five and two microns was a new process, or relatively new process, um, they could only handle a certain amount of radiation. The new ones have part of the process, uh, because you're running lower voltages, you've got to get this gate down much closer to be able to get the field intensities you need to modulate the lower voltages. Uh, so your field oxide is much thinner, and that means that there's much less likelihood that you're going to trap charges in there. And if they do get charge, charge trappings in there, they're easier for them to go out. So they're actual the newer processes, a lot of them, the radiation tolerance has gone up, at least for total dose, uh, total ionizing dose. So that's good. So another thing you need to do, if you ever go to Moses, say, if you design a chip and you go to Moses, and you, uh, I apologize, I have a head cold, and you decide you want to uh, fab a chip, you go and you fab your chip, and you'll find that a lot of times it won't work. You'll come, you'll get it out. Uh, you, if, you, if you just take it right out of the carrier, you'll be able to see the little chip in there. You'll be able to see the little flying uh, gold wires, leads going into the into the pad frame on the chip. And you plug it in, it might not work. First thing you should do is you should hit it with UV light. You should get an old EEPROM eraser if you've got one. You should stick it under there and you should turn it on and you should let it cook for, I don't know, 10, 10 20 minutes. What that's doing is the UV radiation, these photons are coming in and they're going into this and they're hitting these things and they're causing these things to discharge. In fact, they're giving the electrons enough energy that they can jump out and get to where they need to be to be happy. So in fact, that's how, at least how EEPROMs electrically program, let's say programmable, erasable programmable read-only memories, EEPROMs. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. It's kind of old technology these days. That's basically how they worked. You had your FET here. Here's your two channels. Here's your FOX. And there was a floating gate and another field oxide. Maybe I should draw this red right in. And the programming voltage was like 15 volts. So what you would do was you would really put a big positive voltage on here. It's 15 volts and everything else is running at five. And what that allowed was it allowed electrons. It was called hot electron. It's called hot electron injection. They get so much energy that they can tunnel right through this field oxide. They're pulled by that electric field up into here. And some of them actually make it through and leak out, but a bunch get trapped here. And then when you remove this, now you've got all these electrons stuck here and you have a bias. And when you put your five volts on this gate, these reverse it, these null it out, and you don't read out of this memory cell. This is also why there's a limit in the number of writes you can do to it, because as these electrons zip through here, they smack into atoms sometimes and cause little tiny microcrystalline fractures, and eventually this breaks down and it quits, just quits working. But as long as there's no extra field applied, nothing to pull these electrons out, they'll sit there for a long time. I mean, years and years and years. Um, I've got EEPROMs that are uh, going on 20 years old, and they still have their stuff stored in them, and they still work the way they're supposed to. How do you erase it? Well, you stick a UV light on here, and the UV light comes down, energizes these electrons, they pop out whichever way they need to go, and, and, it, and it unprograms the chip, if you will, deprograms it, erases it. Great. So, that's how EEPROM works. Well, so now, we've got, now we understand that radiation, including light, can cause currents in a chip. It can cause excitation of electrons to come out. Of course, then they're going to just recombine. 
Um, so, is there any practical use for all this? I'll tell you one. Uh, we talked about diodes earlier. If I've got a diode sitting out here in space, now wouldn't it be neat if I could just take a diode and take this P in junction? What happens at this P in junction? P and, and I've got my diffusion length right. What happens if light lands here? Well, an electron hole pair is made and then they recombine. And if light lands here, I get an electron hole pair EHP, but then it recombines and goes away. Let's assume I've got some negative and positive voltage on here. Or actually, let's reverse bias it and put a positive and negative here. If a, an electron hits here, I get an electron hole pair that is immediately destroyed because the hole wants to go that way, hole over here, an electron over here, and I've created a photocurrent. This happens thermally. The thermal excitation of the electrons creating this diffusion region is the reason why a silicon diode has about a 0.7 volt voltage drop to turn it on. If you get really, really, really cold, like 100 Kelvin or so, it goes down. Because this comes closer together because there's fewer electron hole pairs being generated. Um, If you have, uh, if you're building a box and it's got its analog circuitry, especially, and it has um, glass encapsulated diodes, if you've ever seen those, they can really screw things up because when light hits them, they conduct extra current, and your circuit is getting that extra current into it. Uh, I once had a case where we had a glass encapsulated diode sitting close to an LED. It was just a troubleshooting LED inside of the thing that it was like a heartbeat or something like that. It would blink every now and then. And we had a long time figuring out why in the heck we were getting this silly pulse on another line. It was because that LED would come on, it would modulate that diode, and it would screw up things on the other line. Real pain in the rear. Uh, it took a while to figure that one out. Um, but that's interesting, right? So now I can take a diode, and a lot of people, I'm going to, I can hook a diode up to an amplifier of some sort and I can get a signal out, right? So I can just take a regular old, uh, any kind of diode. A light emitting diode are pretty good at it. They're kind of frequ frequency selective. But um, this current goes through here, and I get amplification. This is called a trans impedance amplifier because I get I in gives some gain V out, so I over V is equal to R, right? Because V equals I R. And Maybe you got it backwards. You get V per I, I'm sorry. V per I and gain. So this is a trans, trans impedance amplifier. This is how CMOS chips work, CMOS imagers work. They basically put little photodiodes in there. They just have diodes and, and light hits it and, and then they amplify the output. There's a lot more to it than that. I'm simplifying. But the first stage of doing all this with something called a CCD, a charge coupled device. So again, if I imagine my silicon playing here, slightly P positive. I'm going to draw some gates. I'll just lay down some gates. Oh, while I'm thinking about it. In your FETs, a way to prevent the latch up from happening in a high energy environment is to put them inside of guard rings. And the guard rings, so I have my FET eh, in the layout point of view. I'm going to draw the FET. Right? And you've got that, you can put a, uh, your ties out around it. You can put a guard ring of a heavily doped material and tie that off to whatever it needs to be tied to. And, and in this position, and looking at it this way, what you see is your, say, your in-well and your in-well and your gate floating up here. Oops, wrong one. And then this stuff comes down 
like this and is tied off to a potential. And what this does is, you know, this next, this PMOS that's over here, you've basically broken the path through it. It's easier for current to go this way than it is to go around and hit, hit, the, hit the base of that other device and cause your system to latch up. So, get rid of all that. Just as an aside. Because I'm old, I'm scatterbrained, and my mind wanders. I just wanted to get some of this stuff out. I don't know why. So let's do this. We'll make a three-phase CCD. And we'll make our polysilicon run right up into each other without actually touching. And we'll do a connection again. This guy, one, two, three. One, two, three. This guy. This guy comes in, and so on. Well, if this is slightly P plus, and I put a positive voltage here, I put a big positive voltage here. It can work the other way, of course. We're going to get this field underneath of here and here, like we talked about with a regular transistor, right? I'm going to expand this and make it look big. Um, I'm going to get this potential well that forms okay. under here. So I've made this positive. I've driven all the holes out. All the little holes want to come running this way. And so there's no holes in, no holes in here only electrons, except we started off with a P plus in the first place, and because it was a P plus, there was already more holes than electrons to begin with, right? So, there's nothing in there. No, there is, but you know, there's a few, you get occasional heat that causes an electron to bubble up. But now what happens is, if I've got my photon of light comes in, and hits this, if it hits in here, this is a huge field, this is a diffusion area, it runs all the way out like this, so I create an electron hole pair, but now the hole immediately runs away, ah! and the electron is immediately pulled up to there. So as light lands, I get some more electrons, and they all want to be right up here, like this. But the holes keep getting driven away, so I'm attracting my electrons up. It's called a potential well. I'm holding all my electrons in really close, and I'm keeping them together. And the same thing's going on over here. I've got a bunch of electrons that have gathered up over here. Now, let's do this. Let's add positive charge here. So what happens? This comes up. Right? And now I've got all this room, so these electrons are going to go, wee, they're going to run over here because nature abhors a vacuum, right? And all these electrons are going to come running over here and they're going to spill out. And any light coming in is going to generate a few more in this area. And now let's slowly take this voltage away. And we see this well starts to look something like this. And so these electrons are getting squeezed. And so these electrons are gonna run over here, some, and then we take this voltage away all the way and even make it negative. And we basically seal this up. And we've transferred all this charge from here to here. Ch whoops, shoot, I just wrote on my shirt. Just like in the old days when before the days of fire engines and good water pumps, they would have a bucket brigade for a fire. People would handle hand buckets back and forth, a whole brigade of people handing buckets, a bucket brigade. 
This kind of charge coupled device type of transfer is called a bucket brigade device. It's how we do CCD imagers. There's also analog delay lines that work this way where you sample it and you stick it in there and you can slow down how long it takes to get out and you do fun things with it. So we'll do this again, right? We turn this one on. And we do the same thing and we move all of our charge over in a couple of steps with a, with a middle voltage because we take him to just plus and we take him to plus plus. And I just got lost. Now they're over here like this. And then we take him down to zero and, and this moves over. And the same way it happened before, all my electrons are now over here. And so forth. And we do this a really, really long time. We talk about charge transfer efficiency, CTE, not to be confused with the coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, and that has to do with how many electrons get left behind when you move them along. So eventually, you get down here to the end. And we have our transfer gate. And we have an N plus. And he is tied up through a switch somewhere else on the on the thing to some gate potential. And we take an output here. Out. So at some point, if I look at this in terms of these guys, the potential, well, he wants electrons, right? Electrons want to go there. I have moved my electrons to here, and this Pn is a diode, right? And remember that a diode junction here this diffusion has some capacitance C. And here I have stored some amount of charge. So the first thing I'll do is I will reset this. So I will close this up. This charges to 5 VDD. Um, I'll say 5 volts. I don't know. This charges up. And then I will. So now this is at. EDD potential, and now I will open it. So that was reset. I reset my detector. And now I turn on this guy. And a way to look at this is if you look at charge levels, I created a, a hole, and I turn this. This guy over here is a permanent hole that looks like this, a permanent potential well that looks like that. So when I open this up, if I look at it, if I think about it as water, all my electrons flow down into there. It's going to a lower energy state for them. And when you start looking at uh, band gap diagrams and things like this, you'll start seeing this kind of thing all over the place. And it's a way to visualize and, and sort of make sense of these things. So what just happened is all my electrons just went to there. And then I closed this gate. And then I close this gate the same way that we've been doing over here. And all of those electrons have gone there. And what I see at V out, hmm, let me see. Let's go V out. This is time. And this level here is VDD. So who knows where it is here? We don't know where, but then I do a reset, and my voltage goes to here. And now I reset, I'll say reset on, I'll say reset off, 
And when I do that, I have leakage, I have electron injection into the gates, I have a few things that cause my level to go off a little bit. Then I do a transfer, and I transfer it in, and the level comes down here somewhere, and it could be anywhere in this range, depending on how many electrons are in there. And so on the output of this, I put an amplifier, and I'm turning light into electrons, I'm amplifying them, and now I can do whatever I want with them. This camera that we're using to do this right now is doing this right there inside. Um, your eyes are doing something similar. And we do all of our video processing. So this is how we make a video imager in a CCD process. So we look at this and we realize right off the bat a couple of things. Um, CCDs are really clean about it. Every bit of this area where a photon can hit gets used, as opposed to a CMOS imager where, unless you're using a stacked array type thing, a, a, bump, a bump on process, you don't get 100% fill factor, and you can get very close to it with a CCD. You don't have electron noise, you don't have all the other noises, you've only got a single noise source besides thermal, and that's the reset switches and your amplifiers coming out. Whereas in a, in a CMOS device, there's all sorts of amplifiers and other things going on in there. So they're, generally speaking, a lot noisier. They've come a long way in the last 20 years, but if you want to get into um, astronomical and scientific type imaging, it's almost still all CCDs. Um, <clears throat> so what can we do about some of these noise sources? We'll start on the output first. We can do something called correlated double sampling. Correlated double sampling. Correlated double sampling. I know the guy who helped invent it. I used to know the guy who helped invent this. His name was uh, Dave. Uh, damn, what's Dave's last name? He retired about 10 years ago. Um, McCann. Dave McCann and a few other people. They used to work at Westinghouse. They were some of the first people to make CCD imagers. Uh, there's a couple of competing, I think RCA, CBS, Westinghouse. He was one of the people, they built the, they actually were doing Viticon tubes at the time, and he was part of the team, I believe, that made the, uh, the cameras that went to the moon on the lunar landers. So anyway, correlated double sampling, in a nutshell is, there's some uncertainty where this reset level comes to when you switch it off. You never know where. Thermal noise, is going to make it a little different every time, and it can be significantly different because um, we talked about gathering charge here. Um, C equals QV, if I remember right. So Q is the amount of charge you put in, C is the capacitance equals V, so C over Q equal V, if I got it right. Um, one electron noise can make a big difference in this because this is down in uh, what's below pico, millimicro, nano, pico. Femto. This is in femtofarads, probably, or maybe even amptofarads. So this is a really small junction uh, capacitance, and you want it to be because you want a few electrons to make a big difference. Uh, some of the modern imagers can count single electrons, two, three, four, five electrons coming in. Uh, and then they have multiplying stages and things like that that they can do, but that's besides the point. So if I'm going to take this out into the world and I'm going to digitize it for my video camera to put on YouTube, where I guess you're watching this. Um, when I do my reset, before I do the transfer in this time right here, I can sample this. So I do a sample here, and then when this comes in, I do a sample here. So I take two samples. The first sample was of my reset noise. The second noise was of this and I can subtract the two and say this really should have been up here instead of where it was because I got some losses. And so correlated double sampling does that. It also gets rid of some of your flicker noise. It does amazing things. It's practically magic. Um, you pay for it in the hardware. You have to have extra hardware. If you're doing it purely in the digital domain, you've got to have two analog to digital converters and you're gonna have double the data rate coming into your device and depending on whether you do uh, subtraction there. You can do it in the analog domain. It's less hardware, but it's still more hardware. 
Um, where was I going to go with this? One of the other things you can get, there's other noise sources up here at the surface when we cut the silicon, right? So I've got some silicon atom who's all happy to be next to some other silicon atom, who's happy to be next to some other silicon atom, next to some other, next to some other three-dimensional array of these things. And there's these little, uh, there's the, the bonds that keep them together in the crystal structure. Whenever we, if we look at this and we say, oh, well, there's a plane right there, bang. Now this hydrogen bond is just hanging there. And it is basically a hole. And what can happen is, as your electrons transfer in, they can get trapped. These are called traps. It's an electron trap. And it, that electron will go there and it'll get stuck. And I won't stay there forever because eventually thermal uh, heat will give it enough energy to pop out. So if I look at this in, in terms of time, uh, electrons over time, and I say this is what I really got, right? Um, what I measure is going to have some noise on that. Because here one got trapped, so it comes in lower, but here the next time one of those traps released one. And so you got more. More and less, more and less, more and less. So one of the ways you can get rid of that is you can do what's called hydrogen passivation. You stick this in an oven full of hydrogen, and a hydrogen molecule will come in here, and he'll fill that up. And you did leave it a long time, so it has time to get down through the silicon dioxide and everything and cook it. It's a pretty high temperature. But that's called a passivation step. And now you get rid of some of those electron traps. That's cool. One of the other problems you get is, oh, well, gee, these gates aren't transparent. I mean, light gets through them. But if you look at video from a really old imager, an old video camera, you'll notice it looks kind of orange. I mean, not like because my shirt really is orange and yellow, but it they have an orange tint. And that is because the polysilicon is uh, like a red filter, or it's kind of a filter, right? It, it has a band pass, and certain things don't get in. So one of the things we can do is we can change the material of the gates from polysilicon to something like indium, uh, to tin oxide or indium tin oxide. What you pay for there is the indium tin oxide is, tin oxide is fairly transparent to visible light, but it has a relatively high capacitance, and you had to change your process to be able to lay down tin oxide at this level instead of up on a metal layer somewhere. So it's a process change, and that's expensive. And then, and it's also got a fairly high capacitance, or I'm sorry, a fairly high resistance. So that, you know, if you think about these, we talked about it, this is a plate over a plate. This one's sort of tied to ground, and this one's tied to whatever your voltage is. This is a capacitor right here. So it takes time to charge that up and to discharge it. And by using tin oxide, you've created more resistance in the line here. And now you have an RC time constant, right? And from my tech days, I remember that it takes about 5 tau to get to 99.9% .9 charge, or maybe it's 99% charge. So to get that thing charged up all the way, it's 5 tau, 5 RC time constants, 5 times RC. And the more R is, the flatter that curve becomes and the longer takes that. If you want to read out fast images, 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second these days, if you want to get into really high speed stuff, really, really high speed stuff, 5,000 frames per second, um, depending on what you're doing, you can't have that. So they go to indium tin oxide, which brings along its own set of problems. But it's a minor tweak from tin oxide. So one of the other things you can do is you can eliminate this from the back. So it's called a backside illuminated CCD. Let's erase all this garbage. You can send your light in this way, so your photons are zipping in from the backside. But to do that, that means you have to thin this. So you have to backside thin all of this because these wells 
are really shallow, right? We talked about that. We're talking a couple of atoms deep at the most, maybe. Um, so that means then that you have to thin your silicon wafer to the point that it's only, you know, a couple of microns thick maybe, and that's hard because you're you can do a chemical etch to a certain point, but then you want to smooth it out, and they actually stick them on a diamond table, a diamond table, and grind them. And you have to put something on the backside here, then a carrier, to make it strong enough to do that. It's a really tight process. It's hard to do, um, but you can get there. And some of the scientific grade stuff is, in fact, a lot of the scientific grade stuff is backside illuminated. But then you have to add some more metal masks or something over here to protect this stuff from light, because then the light coming in is going to cause all sorts of wonkiness on your output. Um, and then you can put in uh, what you also get in these layers, in these potential wells, is you occasionally get an electron that wants to get out. And there's a way that you can get around that. It's called a buried channel. So you dope the heck out of this thing, and you, you dope it. So this is like P plus, and you'll dope this whole thing down to n minus, right? So now I dope my whole thing from P plus. Yeah, I'm looking at it this way. So my whole wafer is here, and this is P plus. And then I will dope this down to n minus, or maybe even n minus minus. And then I will come back and I will dope this back to P plus or even P++. And this creates a barrier region here. It's called a barrier channel, if I remember right. So these electrons that are running around in here are going to be repelled from that. It's creating a potential well the opposite direction. So it makes sure that this potential well doesn't get all the way down into the silicon. But, or so that these electrons can't get out. It's extra push to push them back in. And a lot of times on your backside illuminated, you'll have that. So you'll have this, in, they'll grind off the P plus region completely maybe, and have this N plus, N plus plus region here. And all these things are doing is, is increasing the likelihood that a, that a photon that you capture and convert to electron, electron you get that electron out in the end. Um, in silicon, Silicon has a responsivity that's very similar to the human eye. Um, if I look at uh, uh, Q, quantum efficiency, QE, of silicon to wavelength of light, I see it has something that looks like this. And down around here is uh, near infrared at about a thousand nanometers or so, maybe 1.1 micron. Um, up around here is about 400 nanometers. And the peak is right around here at um, 600 nanometers or so. So here's blue, here's red. Well, this is IR, about here red and in here is green somewhere. This really closely matches the human eye so it makes silicon an excellent uh, material for detecting visible light. It's also um, got a quantum efficiency, uh, it's not the right word here, it has a photon conversion factor of one that is uh, for every photon that it detects it creates one electron hole pair. So you know that when you get it, get something off of it, you collected that many electrons. And what we do is we put filters up above it, right? A Bayer filter, a green, blue, green, uh, what is it, a red, green, green, blue filter above it, and we can capture the electrons. We know, oh, well, these are in the bandpass of that. They're this color of green. And in the end, if you want to get really fancy, then you could say, well, I can apply this quantum efficiency factor to it and say, you know, like I, if I got this many, then I really got that many. And if I got this many over here, then I really got that many and, and, and back it all off. You can calibrate these things. Thermal noise, you put coolers on these things, make them cold, suck the heat out of them so that you have less thermal motion causing those uh, little electrons to vibrate out. 
Uh, I think that's about all I really wanted to get to today. Um, that's all that's really been haunting my brain. We noticed that in driving CCDs, uh, you don't just have to deal with a voltage on and a voltage off, right? We noticed uh, that we wanted to do a stair stepping of our voltages. Because if you remember the drawing a few minutes ago, I wanted to go from plus plus to plus to minus minus. And so there's these transitions. And so that means that we have to get clever in our driving circuits because now we need three states, well four, we have off, we have high, we have medium, and we have low. So we've got four states that we have to push into to drive the device. The other thing we talked about, um, all those gates have capacitance, right? So when I look at my CCD device and I'm driving it from out here to drive those gates, um, there's some capacitance that I've got to drive in there, but some are, we talked about that. But uh, it's not small. Um, you can get up to, uh, on some of the devices I've seen, this, this capacitance is, uh, it's, it's, you know, 2,000 two picofarads, since nobody likes to use nanofarads, but if you want to call them nanofarads, two nanofarads. And a lot of these voltages we're talking about, they're not digital voltages, it's not zero to five, it's, it's more like um, that low voltage is like minus 15, and the positive voltage is maybe plus two or plus three. So you're talking about a 20 volt swing, and if you remember, um, I equals C dV dt, and if I put two to the negative nine, no micro now, two times ten to the negative nine here, and I talk about a rise time that's let's call it three hundred nano, so we'll say that nano two nano. 2 nano, 300 nano, and a voltage of 20, 2 becomes 1, nanos cancel, um, my current going into there is 1 over 300 amps, which is 100, it's, it's 0.3 milliamps going into there. Some of these things I've seen, the edges are actually up in the amps, like three, four, or five amp type pushes and pulls. So your driver has to be able to drive that into a capacitive load, and if you've got any analog experience, you know driving capacitive loads can lead you to oscillations. So you have to have a very careful driving scheme to do these things, to pay close attention. And of course, any noise that gets in is going to be noise on your output, I and mean, if you're down counting photons, that becomes a problem. So. I guess I'm done for today. I'm covering this because over the years I've been trying to develop my own homemade digital camera for fun. Um, I just thought I'd share some of this stuff with you. So, have a good day.